is good, people. Got another episode of Volney Live. Got my boy Christian coming on today. He is a man of many hats. He is a real estate developer. He is a real estate agent. He has been around the block many, many times. He's been some, through some ups and some downs. This is going to be a great interview for anyone who just wants to learn about building a real estate network, building a real estate business, and you know all the things that go into that. Um, I met him a few years ago, and we've been working together on a bunch of different projects, working together on building each other's networks, helping each other out. And I think it's a perfect example of how uh, you know when you meet someone in this business who's like minded, who has you know the same sort of ideas and the same sort of goals, you can really work together to build each other's businesses. Um, so he should be joining in shortly. And, uh, you know, make sure throughout the entire interview, you guys send questions in um, and we'll try to get to, you know, any questions that come in. But he's got a really interesting story and I think it's uh, it's a must watch for, uh, you know, anyone who wants to really, uh, you know, build a, a business in the in the tough Boston market. What's up, buddy? What's going on? How are you? You're sideways. Yeah. All right. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> How's talking. it going? I'm so not good at this. Uh, <laughs> I got to like, put go. my phone on do not disturb you say. Well, just so you can get phone calls and stuff, it won't, uh, it won't like stop, like pause it when they call you. They'll still come in though, right? Yeah, they'll come in. They'll just go to voicemail. Cool. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Um, Struggle Spent an hour trying to get this ready. <laughs> All right, there we go. There we go. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, I kind of gave a little intro before, but for you know you 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 know it best. So let's tell tell me about your journey. When the when did the uh, biz, the world of real estate start for you? Um. So it's interesting. I think like we all have like we all have we all start somewhere, but we all end up kind of the same place and on a similar path, but everyone's journey is a little different. So, you know, it's interesting. I, um, I, I kind of like, um, I don't know. I didn't really, I didn't go to school or anything. I was just kind of, you know, bounce around different jobs when I was younger. And I think like you get into it, like you see people doing stuff and that kind of motivates you and inspires you. Um, to kind of get involved in some in some different stuff. I had a friend who just started, you know, he was a painter and he just started like flipping houses, like bought a house, flipped it. And uh, when this all started like going on, like friggin' 2000, like four, 2005, it was early. And I was like, he's just a painter. If he can do that, like I got to get on the bus. And um, I was a little kind of wild when I was younger, um, really wild and kind of, you know, everyone's path's a little different. I kind of mind weave through the court system and jail for a little bit in and out. And after I knew I didn't want to do that anymore, I said, I got to kind of come up with a better way. And um, so I had, um, you know, I had some different jobs bounce around here and there, saved up some money. And um, in 2007, end of 2006, I ended up buying my first investment was a two family in Medford. Um, bought it off MLS, you know, market was like on the tail end back then. I didn't, I knew nothing about nothing. I had like literally my last job, like I had always loved deals, but kind of the wrong kind of deals that got me in trouble. And I just knew that path wasn't going to work for me. So I was like, had blind ambition, which is like, it's good, but it's like, it's, it's scary as well. And, um, Cause you don't know what you don't know. And, yeah. uh, so I just went and bought a two family with knowing nothing. And, uh, my friend though was a really good carpenter. And so we decided to just rip that thing apart and turn it into two condos and, um, ripped it to four walls, built two condos, like, you know, first deal overbuilt it, just built to what, you know, I thought was great. Uh, didn't know what a budget was just blew through everything. It just, every stop sign, every red light and, uh, finished it and the market tanked. Uh, it was terrible. Couldn't sell it overpriced, but knew nothing though. Knew nothing about building to the location, keeping within a budget, 
So at the end, you have something you're emotionally invested in. I fell in love with it, priced it because I thought it was worth, you know, a billion and it wasn't even worth whatever. And um, so I sat on it. Um, but I, in the process, it was like my master's in building, you know, like it just, I learned so much on that job. And um, it was the first deal I ever did. I just knew, like, I wanted to make money and do something. I saw this, this like, kid from school that was, like, kind of a schmuck doing it. I said, if he can do it, I can. I'm, like, I'm only a higher level of a schmuck than him. I could probably do it a little better. So, um, but I, it was good. I kind of fell on my face. And so that was, I sold one unit. Then I ended up, like, carrying another unit for a year. Kept having price reductions. Blew out every credit card carrying it. Didn't know, like, what to do with... Um, the loans, this and that, which I pay myself, this and that. So I finally lived in it for a year, then sold it to a family member like a year later, just because the market was so bad. I got some money, paid down some lines, blew my credit out completely in the process. But in the, in the span of that time, like a year, like found another deal and off single, you know, single uh, family off market, kind of took what we knew from that, ran with my carpenter. We did that deal, cleaned it up, sold it, and um, just kind of went on a tear of um flip you know cleaning up flip flipping um you know singles you know mu you know conversions and um did well and just learned along the way but i really hated like um i hated building the building end of it um not what i just you know it was just part of the process so you kind of had to you know to get to point z you had to go through you know that's what i really like doing when, um was really, you know, what got me excited. I just, I got sick of like running the job site, running the subs, running the Home Depot, you know, dealing with the architects and then trying to, in the meantime, you know, deal with the finance and then try to like find, in the meantime, find another deal and all, all of this. And so um, a little frustrating, but went through that. And then I, I came across, this is what kind of like changed my view on how I went after things after this. I came across a deal in Winchester, single family, and everything was off market. After that one market deal I bought was, you know, I just started buying stuff, word of mouth or driving around uh, off market. I, you know, pick up some deals. I was doing fine. Um, but I found this house in Winchester right in the center. Uh, left the guy a note, wanted to sell. Took me like, you know, a couple of months to finally get him to commit. And um, he was like a hoarding situation. It was crazy. It was like literally like something from the TV show. But mm -hmm. You know, I was blown away when at that time I was like, oh, am I sh sure I'm like buying this? But now, like, I look for those. I'd love to find those. Yeah. You know, so it's so funny how like you, you learn in the process. So so I bought I got this deal. I'm buying it for 400. This is like a really unique deal. Um, so I'm buying it for 400 uh, guys got insurance on the property for 400,000 day before closing. He decides to light a fire while he's clearing out his pack rat of a nest log rolls out place burns to the ground burns to the ground so we're supposed to close the next day so per the purchase and sale and this is like little things you learn along the way which is so cool per the purchase and sale if there was a casualty uh he would have to you know restore the property to its previous condition at the time it was put under contract uh with the insurance proceeds or sign them over to me at the closing for me to do so so we show up for the closing and uh, now, now, mind you, the closing doesn't take place right away. It's like three, four months. The, the insurance company's investigating it. State police, arson task force investigating it, interviewing me. I had zero to do with it. Um, <laughs> they didn't think that was the case at the time because I was, you know, uh, I was kind of a different person then. But anywho, had nothing to do with it. And so one time I could like literally say I was guilty and not guilty, not guilty. And just, <laughs> good. Like, I could just sit there and be like. I got kind of shit for you, but uh, so anywho, we go to the closing. He shows up with his check, four hundred thousand. Hands it over to me. I sign it back, hand it back to him. Boom! I now own the land. In the next room, I got a developer, a friend, who I had already lined up to sell the land to for six hundred. So we leave that closing. We walk into the next room, and I sell the land to a friend of mine who was buying it to uh, build a house for his mother for 600,000. And I'm like, boom, my mind is blown. Like, holy shit. I just made like friggin' like literally like a half a milli. And I didn't even have to like deal with a sub, run to Home Depot, swing a hammer and like a light bulb went off. And I'm like, 
that's it. I'm not doing, I am like, if this is a way, and that's lightning in a bottle, that's an extreme case. Yeah. The odds of that ever happening again are like probably, they're just impossible. But to me, it's like divine intervention. So, but it just, it set off in my mind, like, all right, well, there's a different way to do this. I, I hate construction. Like, I don't want to, I just want to find deals and sell to developers and other contractors. Cause that's the part I like. I like finding the deal, dealing with the homeowner, you know, whoever, uh, getting the property under contract and, you know, checks are exciting. It's fun to cash checks. You know, the, that lag time in between is, is to grind. And if you're not like really adept, like I don't swing a tool belt and you know, my, my, my running an Excel spreadsheet is even worse. So if I can <laughs> take those steps out yeah. and get me to a closing and cash a check, all goody for me. Um, so I started going out like not just driving for dollars, like just driving like crazy, like leaving notes, calling. So, yeah. Let's, what's the best. Yeah. So for people watching and trying to build their, you know, cause a lot of people watching, you know, might not have a business yet. So they're like, and I hear this all the time. Keep asking, like, I got nothing. I don't have, it's like, well, step one. So talk, you know, what do they do? So you're, you're, you know. So this is what I'll say. So step one is like, so I started by like trying to broker wholesale deals, which is like, it just, I learned how bad, like how bad this business can suck. Like it just sucks being on the end of like that, especially that murky world. You're not a real agent. It's not MLS. It's like, you know, you know, and there's a ton of wholesale dudes out there who are just like flipping deals that aren't theirs, trying to get a fee, this and that, a finder's fee. And, you know, people get fucked left and right. And like that got old to me. And I was like, there's got to be a better way. So I started like, instead of like trying to broker other people's deals, I just started to like, you know, try to find deals and find your own deals and take control of them. And once you take control, then you don't have to be the middleman. You don't have to worry if you're getting paid. You know, people are going to, if it's a good deal, you're going to have a, an audience. And so the key is, and, and I mean, it's the whole key of what runs my business today. And I just, you know, in my whole career of doing this is just to have a seat at the table, add value is, you know, bring a good deal. It all starts with a good deal. If you have a good deal, like and it's the starting point. You, you can earn a seat at the table. People who regularly wouldn't even talk to you, you're going to get their attention. They're going to talk to you. And in my beginning, no one wanted to talk to me. Like, I'm still a little loose right now. But when I started, wild. Just knew nothing about nothing. If you Google my name, it was toxic. It was nuclear. Like, you could just pull up all kinds of stuff that just wasn't good or related to real estate. So, but if over time, it would force people to talk to me. And they had to because if they wanted to deal. Uh, you just froze for a second here. Um, seems like it's frozen. You should be back in a sec. Um, yeah, so you guys, hopefully Christian pops back up here in a second. Um, but yeah, send over any questions. We'll get those answered all at the end. Um, uh, he lo we lost him, but I'm going to get him joined back in. What's up, Benny? Um, what's up guys? Yeah. So, um, let's get, you know, definitely send me in. Um, yeah. Keep sending questions. I see Kathy Murphy. Thanks for sending that in. We're going to have Christian get, uh, answer all of these, you know, all these questions for us. Um, I know one thing I'm interested in, here he is. Let's get him back. Yo, you're back. Too much? No, no. <laughs> we um, had to go to commercial break? Yeah, I had, I had to fit in an ad. I got to make some money here. Yeah, I hear um, But yeah, so, so talk to me about, I think this is one of the hardest parts, is for someone who's hunting for a deal, and you're, say when you come across it, so you drop a note. Well, first, someone, a couple people message. So what are the best, step one, what's the best ways for people to get those conversations going? Is it cold calling? Is it dropping notes? Is it mass mailings? Um, and so let's start there. Let's, where's it's, it's all, a, so I knew nothing. And like, I literally, I had no mentor. I had no school. And like, I read everything. I read like every book, 
every course online. Um, but the answer is all the above. Before I used to drive around, I drive for dollars. Then I ran out of road. I started to like, like um, the kind of network with like attorneys and like, you know, I'd go to probate and pull things and that was laborious. And, you know, as soon as someone would Google my name, they would never ever call me back. <laughs> And that was really tough in the beginning. Like for me, it was really like I was trying to transition and get myself in a better spot. And um, it was tough. Like I didn't have a resume. I didn't have anything. You'd, you know, Google and Google, like whatever. It's just, you know, I had a past. So, um, but then I started doing mailings. And mailings was a really effective way to just hit a large part of the population. And then you'd have calls coming into you. I mean, you can only, how many houses can you drive by? How many people can you talk to? I put a list together. In my first mail and it was like 20,000 people. And at the first deal I got from it, I mean, it's crazy. I turned a half a milli on a yeah. one deal I picked up. So I would say, but you got to do everything. I mean, I've had people call me word of mouth and I picked up a deal. I mean, you got, you got to, the thing with this business is it's very, very competitive. It's a low barrier to entry. Um, you know, people see people doing really well and they're like, oh, I want to get into real estate, you know, and they see the high performers, but they don't know what it takes to get there. It's a low barrier entry, but a very, very high, you know, hard level to, to perform at that top level. And, and it just, it's relentless. You got to be, you know, every different pipeline. Uh, so you know, calling, mailing, knocking. Mailings. So the mailings, is there a platform that you like to use? Do you still do the mailings? Um, um, yeah, I say... If you're not mailing, you're not making money um, to me. I, I just, I curate my own list off of MLS, just public records. Um, and it's really, it's, it's not like a really crazy algorithm to this. You know, yeah. I'm not the brightest guy here. I didn't invent Facebook. It's, you know, size of house. I go only after multis, number of years owned in blue chip locations. You know, they're going to probably be highly motivated to sell if they've owned it for over 20 years. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a numbers game. I mean, you're probably on mailing, you only see literally like, probably like a 1% return. But that 1%, I've never not mailed in six years that I've been doing it and have never not made money. And when I say not make money, like I've never done a mailing that I've never made less than 100,000. And I've done mailings where I've cracked a million. And so what, what, yeah, what platform are you? So you're cur curating your own list, public record, downloading the names, mail addresses, all the, of the owner information. Then what are you uploading that onto one of the mailing platforms? Yeah. I, so I use a company out of Florida, direct mail, direct mail. Um, okay. Oh no, I'm sorry. They're not called direct mail. Uh, postcard mania. Sorry. Postcard, yeah, mania. postcard mania. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty good. They have lists. I've never, you bought a list. I don't, if you buy a list, you're buying the same list everyone buys. Right. When I first started, like, I'd be the only letter there. It was like a novel idea. And then, like, over the years, it'd be two, three letters there. I show up now, there's 15 letters there. Yeah. I get a nice letter. I don't know. So it, it works. But so do, you you, do, you, do, you, you, do you change up the color? Do you change up the way it's written? Is there something uh, that's worked really well for you? I can grab it. Let me grab it. Hold on. <clears throat> Guys, keep sending over questions. We'll get to all the, you know, any questions. Use the question um, option in the in the Instagram so you can actually send me a question and I can share it right onto the screen. Um, you know, I think this is a part of the business where I have never excelled at. Like, I've never, you know, been someone who's going out and door knocking or sending letters. And I think it's it all comes back to f sourcing the deal in this business. Like, the money is made in the purchase. And so from anyone who's trying to get into this business and is trying to build a business and build a network, if you can source deals, you will always, as, as Christian said, have a seat at the table. All right, so, so here we go. So this is my letter. It's got a nice little banner across the top. Um, this has evolved over time. Does that, that banner goes across the envelope so it catches their eye when they um, mm -hmm. hits their mailbox. Um, it doesn't look like a generic one. When they open it up, it has their name on it. It's not like height, homeowner. It's got this banner. I don't know, but people seem to like these colors. And it's just the same pitch. You know, we'll buy it for cash. Take it as is. You don't have to worry about anything. Call me if you're interested. And, um, you know, you drop Short, 20, and, short and sweet. Yeah, you drop yeah. 20,000 of those. 
but do it four or five times a year. You got a hundred thousand business cards out there, you know, ninety yeah. percent of them probably end up in the trash. But you know, other people put them on the fridge. They put them in their thing. You know, I've had people call me and say, "My mother had this on her dining room table uh, with a note to call you," and she just passed away. And so we're calling, and I feel terrible, but it's you know, it works. And yeah. so um, mailing changed everything for me in terms of scale. Um, so I had I had did well in the beginning. Uh, just kind of flipping things, this and that. And then um, I was also naive and I just thought this was the money tree. Forget it, hit the lottery. This is just, you know, make a hundred thousand, spend 150, go back to the money tree and grab another hundred. And then I didn't realize about cycles in real estate and <laughs> I hit a cycle and then, you know, um, it coincided with, you know, kind of me spending a lot of money and, um, you know, you make a lot of money and you think you're smarter than you are, um, you know, and, um you know, that cycle coincided with me spending a lot of money and not focusing on my business. And then the market turned and I wasn't able to turn deals. And I ended up, you know, I was broke. And not only was broke, then I got diagnosed with cancer. And I was like broke and sick. So it made me, you know, in that time, uh, it took me like a year to recover and whatnot. I had a lot of time alone. I'm like, you know, kind of not like, like this climate right now, just spend some time alone and think how you're going to come out of it. And, um, in that period, like I used to just think it was like, oh, whatever, flip a house, make some money, go blow the money. Make I didn't treat it like a business or really seriously. When I came out of that, I treated like I, I treated it like a business and started taking things a lot more seriously. And um, and the the foundation of that was you know the letters. Like I said, I came out the first deal. I bought a house in Somerville on Summer Street. A two family it had been completely done over. I paid nine hundred for it. The woman just wanted out, wanted to go to California. It was the end of you know, summer 2014. And I went in literally vacuumed and painted the interior, put the upstairs on for 899 downstairs on for 599 guy came in from Harvard, or some kind of horticulturist, chemist, or whatnot, bought the whole thing a million five for him to live upstairs and his daughter to live downstairs, boom, cash one five. And I literally went from like broke, I made a half a mil on my first deal back. Two weeks later from a letter I stuck in the door in Davis Square, picked up another two family, I paid 850 sold it for like, I think a million fifty. Uh, yeah. And um, it was crazy. I mean, the amount of money you can make. Uh, but again, it all comes down to finding the deal, controlling the deal. I don't, you know, really flip paper. I, I always close on the deal in case. Something so that's, sideways. yes. So that's my and next so, question. Yeah. So that's like, a big part of like, you know, you can talk flipping and this and that and the numbers, but it's the how behind it. Like, so a big part of this is like, you know, you got to educate yourself. You got to know the neighborhood you're working in. You, you like, you got to know the markets of what you're working in, like cold. Like when I was working in Somerville, like I knew every house, every neighborhood. There wasn't, I knew value. So if you understand value, then that's the basis of everything. But then you also need, you know, you got a partner. You can't do everything by yourself. So coming out of that in 2014, my credit was in shit. I had no money. I wasn't using banks. Um, I hooked up with, a, you know, my an attorney who's now, now my attorney and good friend now um, out of Somerville, Rich DiGirolamo, who's just a, a very, very, you know, you know, the guy in Somerville and just a very, very, very smart, um, not only just attorney, but an investor. And um, he helped me, you know, he had known me a little bit before um, that and kind of knew my deals and my ability. And he, he you know, he gave me advice and he, he, he bankrolled me. I mean, this is like, you know, you're talking real money, a million dollars, this and that. And so he became a lender and a mentor. And without him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here today. I mean, I wouldn't have had half the success I had. So, I mean, it's sometimes you find a deal and like, you think you have to eat the whole pie, you know, and you don't know when you're going to find your next one. So you hang on to it like this. And that's just not the case. The key to, you know, survive and thrive and grow is partners. And because um, you don't know everything. And so you got to be humble enough to reach out for help and, um, you know, find mentors, especially in this business. I mean, in any business, but certainly for this business. And, um, you know, he became the foundation of me being able to just I went on a run through, you know, for three years and primarily through Somerville and Charlestown. But, you know, putting I probably put 25, 30 deals under contract, sold them to other developers, cherry picked the rest for myself, any multis near Tufts and built a rental business because I needed to, I went from being broke to like, I don't want to be in that position again. Like I need to start thinking about the future and, you know, when the next cycle downturns, you know, having uh, income coming in. 
but it is it's it's hard to get from here to there but it all starts with just finding the deal you know you got to find the deal don't market someone else's deal i mean if that's all you have and you but you're brokering someone else's deal so many people send me deals you know they just press forward then the deal doesn't even work like do the analysis on it to see if the numbers work and um you know find your own deal they're out there everyone's like well it's hard to find the deal. of course it's fucking hard to if it wasn't no one be, everyone would be doing it of course like i devote all my time more so then than now because it's kind of my my business has changed a little but like relentless just like this that's all i focus on i didn't care what anyone else was doing and i never got jealous never got envious like i'm only in competition with myself i want to be the best that i could be and just you know foot on the pedal you know, you can go and just laser yeah. focus. And I think you got to have that drive. If you don't have that drive, you're not going to succeed, not only in this you know, business, but anywhere. And um, so, I mean, so for guys just starting out, you have to, you know, it's knocking doors. You're going to hear a thousand no's before you hear that yes. But when you hear that yes, it's going to be good. And then, yeah. you know, it doesn't take, you know, this deal, you might, you know, get one or two great deals a year, but you might look at 500. And so people just starting out kind of get, you know, a little, um, what do you say? Like, um, yeah, know. frustrated or. Yeah, you get frustrated or they just give up. Like, to me, that's why I like, like, just there's no give up. Because whenever people start falling off, that's when you're kicking in high gear and you keep going. And that's when you start to see success. So. Um, so let's. That- Let's let's talk about um let's talk about coming out of last recession because that's something I think a lot of the people haven't seen who are watching here. You know, what did you what did you see coming out of the last recession? Cause we're gonna be into a recession here. We're gonna see down we're gonna see people selling stuff for under lower than we were seeing a year ago. Um, mm-hmm. you know, how did you capitalize on that coming out of oh eight into the you know, as you said, you that's when you went on a tear. Um, was it all the same stuff? Was there any difference in the conversations you were having with people? I think, you know, and, yeah, to uh, me, I mean, there, to me, there's no bad market. It's literally like, there's always, there's always a motivated seller somewhere. It's your job to find them. That's it. You know, I mean, anything that's on MLS and with the broker has already been marked up to a beyond a retail price. They got someone in their ear. And, and that's just not your target. You know, the, the 95% of a conventional retail seller is not your target. So that's a huge swath of the population. So you can't get frustrated. You just got to, you know, know that deals out there. And yeah, so like right now, and then even then, the story is, you know, the sky is falling. If you're thinking about selling, now's the time. You know, in the past three years, that story hasn't really worked for me. It's been a, a, a seller's market and I got frustrated. I took a little break because it's just, it was very competitive. There's a lot of people got involved in this business. Um, I don't know if I'm watching HDTV or watching uh, who knows what, but just people that weren't in this business uh, try to get their foot in. So I think it will shake a lot of people that aren't in it for the long run who might have just dabbled, which mm-hmm. is good because you get, you get, you know, some of the, um, you know, you'll get, you'll shake out the market, which is good. And then the conversations with the seller absolutely become a lot easier. Um, but, you know, I think there's more opportunities for sure. Um and if in the end of the day, like you make your money when you buy it. So, you know, I learned that the hard way in the beginning, but it doesn't matter what the climate is. doesn't matter what the market is. You make your money when you buy it. Sure. Like on the sell side, like in 2014, 15, when things were so crazy over in Somerville. Yeah. I mean, I'd have, you know, everyone was looking for a deal. I had a mail list, like an email list of a hundred investors that be, you know, I'd have three, four offers on a deal it's a little different now and it's going to probably be that way. It's going to shake out and um, you know, you'll have only this, you know, the serious people, but it just makes business, I think a little more clear and concise. Um, But there's, there's always opportunity. If you're willing to work hard, there's always opportunity. If you, you you know, the people who aren't doing things, they're going to use as an excuse, you know, but. So let's talk about the conversations. I think one of the things people get scared of is, you know, all right, I've, I've decided to do it. I'm going to make letters. I find my list. Awesome. Then you, you put it out and you get that phone call, right? And now these kids are like, they're, now they have to step up and talk to a to home. Say. They don't know what to say. So it's like, that is, a, I feel like, the best. And that's where I think you excel is understanding that communication with a homeowner, getting it for the right price and understanding that, you know, needing to do that negotiation. So 
run someone through like things that have worked well for you. Like you get that call in, Hey, got the letter. Uh, call you know, me. I'll take that... it over. I'll take care of it. Yeah. How's that, get that call? Call me. I'll help you. <laughs> I'll take you right through it. Yeah. No, uh, it's, it is. Well, it is. No, it is unnerving. Um, you do that. You're all excited. You spend the money. And for a lot of these like young cats just starting, like they don't got like a meal and like eight, eight grand like that's real money like that's i mean twenty thousand pieces even if you do half of that that's like five grand a lot of these young kids starting out they don't have that kind of money but like scared money don't win baby so yeah just, that's it you know don't be afraid to throw it out there it will come back if you believe in yourself but a lot of people don't so that's that's you got to get over that fear number one um but yeah so you spend the money they'll do a mailing and then you get the phone call. Then like that first time the phone rings, it's like, uh, you don't know what to do or say. Do you use your cell or do you use like a Google, a Google answering number? Uh, no, 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 no. Everyone, I could lie. That's the difference. Like, <laughs> cause everyone usually goes to a voicemail. Like my letter says, call me personally. You yeah. get me personally. <laughs> and you know, sometimes I get people are lonely and they want to chat. That's okay. <laughs> we can yeah. chat. That's it. <laughs> Obviously, you got a letter, you own some property. Maybe one day you'll think of that nice boy who let you talk to you for an hour about prices, right? And you call me back. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So I do, the number is routed through, I don't know, Postcard Mania has some generic number that logs every call. Yeah. I get a spreadsheet of every call, every number, this and that. Um, but it does ring direct to my phone. I don't let anything go to voicemail um, because most companies have everything go to voicemail. And I think when someone hits a voicemail, they hang up. Um, yeah. You know, you get someone in that moment that's calling. They're more. That's the moment. Something might have happened. You know, they're yeah. just this. The, and this is why you got to be mailing all the time, is because you know. And that's another thing. People will get frustrated. They'll do a mailing and they don't see the result they wanted right away, and they don't do another because they're afraid. Now they spent the money. They don't want. You got to be continually. It will pay off. Um, do you keep but, hitting the same list? Oh yeah, a thousand. Yeah, of course. So bang, 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 hit him, yeah. hit him, hit him, hit him. But yeah. it's always, it's on age. So right. it's always repopulating with some new ones in there. Yeah. But yeah, because I mean, the, the mythology behind it is like, it's, you know, and I liken it to like mattress ads. Like, you know, every time you get a flyer in the mail from whoever, it's, it's the mattress is half off. They're having a President's Day seal. They're having a Labor Day seal. They're having this seal. Like how often do you go mattress shopping? You know, like you're buying every, but that day you open it up, holy shit, they're having a seal. I should run down there. <laughs> so this is the same thing. How often are people selling their house? Not like every week. It's not like they're going to buy milk. So you just got to keep hitting them. That one day that pipe breaks, they have a fight with someone, this and that, the tenant's not paying rent. And they're like, fuck it, I'm done. I want to sell. And lo and behold, this little baby shows up. Yeah. I don't got to worry about tenants. I don't worry about anything. This is yeah. Like, I think that's one thing people are going to see. I've been telling my team about it. Like if May and June rent does not come in for a lot of these landlords, you are going to see people getting those letters and going, fuck this. I'm out. Right. And it's like, they, yeah, I'm out. I don't want, I don't need this stress. I got a great job. I don't, I I don't want to lose. I don't want to get my credit fucked over not paying my mortgage. So they don't have any savings or any reserves. So like if you're the letter that comes in and then they're like, Oh yeah, they, they might, have it might be worth 900 but they paid 500 right so like the one i posted the other day in dorchester they paid 250 for the six family right so they sold it to me for 1.2 even though it was probably worth it appraised for one six the the reason the reason they did that is because them they just wanted out and they yeah. made a million dollars it's so, a lottery ticket for them i mean yeah at this point it's not a sophisticated seller you're hitting them with seven figures it's, it's literally like a lottery ticket. And at that point, I mean, a lot of the psychology behind this with the, a lot of these sellers is it's peace of mind. They just want to be done. And yeah. who's going to get them from point A to point B with like less hassle? Like I've showed up to steps where there's other guys there with a letter. I, there's a broker there. Broker telling them they can get them one, one. They got to have an open house, clean up this. And I'm telling you, I'll give you 900, but I'll take you from here to your new place and we'll put the silverware in your drawer. You don't have to worry about anything and no one will come through and we'll help you from point A to point B. And they've gone with me and left 200 on the table. And I, I think a lot of this times that's, you know, the people who are selling to us and that you want to deal from, it's that kind of situation. It's, it's, you know, 
they've either inherited the house, their house, their house rich, they're cash poor. Mm -hmm. They don't want to deal with the anxiety of, you know, the house is a wreck. They can't, they don't have the funds to straighten it out. They don't want people coming through. They got shit everywhere and they just want to be done. Like when people get to that point uh, mentally that they're just done, they're done. If you can give them turnkey, the quickest path to that, it's not even about the money. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's the thing too, is that they don't even, they can have like these, you, you can have 800, a million in equity in these buildings and literally have, they could have no credit, pretty much no credit. Cause they've, you know, they, and then they could have defaulted on other shit. They're real estate rich. They can barely afford the taxes and all the expenses. And it's like, when you come to talking to them, you're, you gotta understand that 800 grand in equity, like it's not physical for them. They haven't touched it in, in right. 20 years sometimes. So it's, that's the conversation. I, so, I mean, you know. at that point, you're telling them, you know, cash you out, you're going to make 700, you're going to make 900. These people haven't seen a hundred in their whole life. It's, right. it, it doesn't, you could be saying it's a million or two million. It doesn't matter at this point. It's how you unlock it. That's a key. How do you unlock it? And so here's like, you got to get creative. Like I'll do stuff that other people won't do. And like, you know, I have examples of like, I have, you know, people need places to go before they can get out. I've released deposits. I've helped them find new places, release the deposits, have, you know, put, put the money down, help them get situated. Cause you know, they're not buying new places or whatever. I, I bought another house in my name, just put the, got it to purchase and seal, put the deposit down, put that towards, you know, the credit towards the purchase price of when I was buying, you got to get creative. And a lot of people stop at that point because they don't want to be risky with their money. They don't have the mental bandwidth to deal with these, you know, these people, or they don't know the steps you have to go. So you may find a motivated seller, but you got to get them out of the house. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you just leave it to them. You don't even think like, Oh no, you are, if you want the deal, like you got to go above and beyond. I mean, yeah. I've had people go in, we've sent people to girls in to help them pack. I tell them, just take what you want. We'll pack the rest. We'll put it in your new place, help you unpack it and uh, leave the rest. And so, you know, you yeah, gotta I think, be creative. I think getting creative is key. I mean, we've done probably five or 10 deals where it's, it's so out of the box, but you gotta propose it, right? Someone's like, oh, I can't make this work. There's an option. We can, and it's always find a way. So it's like, we've had deals where exact, you know, where we've done all different, all different avenues, but it's every deal's different and you gotta be creative and come up with ways and propose it to the seller. Right, you know, come up with something that would work, and you never know; they might say yes. Yeah, nothing's um, crazy to me. Like my goal is to get you out of this house and for me to close on it, and there is nothing that will stop me. Like I am, like there's nothing crazy, and that's how you got to think. Like there's absolutely nothing crazy. Like I move people. I I let someone. I blew out twelve grand on my Jordan's furniture credit card once to get someone's house furnished, and just sent an invoice to the lawyer at the end and itemized everything I did from the down payment on the new house they got, the Jordan furniture, the mover. I do it all. Like, it's literally, like I say, it's turnkey, full service. We'll pick you up in your recliner and put you back in your new place. You don't got to move. Just cash the check, baby, and sign. And um, um, so it's good. I mean, you'll see it like what we're working on now in Southie is, a, is an ideal situation. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's a good, interesting one, but um, yeah, but the, the key is, you know, I think a lot of people, especially young people getting into this is like super ambitious, super want to make it super seeing guys that are crushing it, but that's here and that's here. What's in between and in between is like, how do you add value to a guy like you? How do you get your attention? How do you get my attention? And like, I'm always willing to help people, but like help by here's the steps, go do the steps. Now let me see the results. Don't just keep chomping in my ear because my time's yeah. precious. But I, think, I think one thing you mentioned before is knowledge too. And it's like, guys, if you're an agent, you need to understand the values of every property. If you're doing mailings, you need to understand what that, that house is worth. So when, when you get the call, it, you need to be extremely knowledgeable in the area. So like it's, and like if you, someone calls me about an area that I do projects, I can, I can make an offer on the phone. On the phone. Right. I know, I know so, what I can pay. Um, a thousand so, percent, a thousand. And like a lot of, I think a lot of these, like that's the disconnect. Like they get the call 
They don't know what to say. They don't know value. And they, they're afraid to share the deal because they're holding it so tight and they'll fuck it up. And yeah. then I come in. Yeah. I'll scoop um, it. We got a couple of questions here. So speaking of creating offers, how do you explain to someone a subject to for someone's property that would be per a perfect for it? Seems like a very difficult explanation to a seller. Subject to what? So like subject to any, any type of contingency. So I guess subject probably, you know, uh, Tina, you can send a follow up. But I mean, the way we do it on in a lot of my deals are subject to zoning or subject to permitting. Yeah. And the key to that, and it works so great for my business is like, I present with that to them what their property is worth right now. And then I explain to them what I'm willing to pay. And they're like, well, why aren't you doing big deposits? Why aren't you, why aren't you just buying it now? I'm like, if you want me to buy it now, I'm paying 600. If you want to give me 12 months subject to approvals, I'll pay you 800. So it's like, you're, you know, I'm buying 12 months for $200,000. And, you know, yeah, and no, a thousand percent. They need to. I mean, I get that. Again, we always get that in like, yeah. well, I want this. Well, you got to share in the upside. I mean, you can't. Everyone wants the upside price today, but no one wants to go through the process. So you got to go through the process. And I mean, unless they're a moron, most people get it. But a lot of people are morons and a lot of people don't get it. So how do you deal? How do you deal with people who have had their minds fucked by agents who just lie? Because like so many times yeah. you go up to talk, you get a letter or someone hits you up. So Joe told me that my property's worth a million. And you're like. Yeah. So that's pretty easy. I, get, I used to get like frustrated with that. But it's like, you know, there's a couple like, well, A, of course, they're going to paint the rosiest picture. They're getting a commission off it. If it was worth that much, it would have already been sold. You're going to talk to five guys like me all our prices aren't going to be that very different. So it's just a matter of being comfortable. Like of who, who, like I'm, I'm have no problem telling someone go talk to five other people and then come back and talk to me because I know my numbers are spot on. And, you know, and that's one thing, like you can't fixate on a seller. That's just not, I used to try to win like every deal, win people, like you can win a deal and overpay to realize you didn't win shit. Yeah. And so you got to like figure out where you're going to devote your time. And that was, hard. that's hard when you're younger, I think, because you do, you want to win and you just, you think closing a deal and getting a deal is a win. It's not always a win when you're, you're upside down on the deal. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the market's going to speak for itself. Anyone who's doing what, you know, they're doing, it's going to, uh, everyone's going to be within the same price point, you know? Yeah. I think you tell, you, you know, I've had this conversation. I say, call up Joe and tell him to bring you some offers because yeah. He, offered, he told you that, but where are they? Oh, I didn't want to sign a listing agreement. Well, if Joe, call him and, and see if he's got actual buyers because your house isn't worth that much. Yeah, or, or it's just like, well, you know, I'll tell people, like, before I used to, like, try to come up with more, like, lines, I'm straightforward now, and it seems to work a lot better of, like, yeah, you can go that route. That's a retail route. You're going to have to deal. You're going to pay a brokerage fee. You're gonna, they're going to have an inspection. You're going to have, you know, maybe some risk with a mortgage in financing, you know, you're going to have a bunch of people traipse through and, you know, who knows where you end up. I can get you at that same price today as is. And it's like, we're paying it's with, with the, with Zillow and everyone knowing what their neighbors sold. Like we're paying market rates pretty much minus a brokerage fee. Like there's maybe 10 to, you know, in a good scenario, we're getting a 20% off of retail yeah. average. 10, 15% for ease of transaction. And most people understand there's no, there's no bullshit factor and I'm not paying a commission. And you know, you and I, you know, for the most part, we're looking beyond that. You see the value that's locked in that can be created by either creating more bedrooms or you're going to convert it over this and that. So like, when was the last time you got a deal that was like an absolute home run? Like, the, like I'm not buying things for 500 that are worth a million. It yeah. just doesn't even happen anymore. Like there's just too much competition. There's too much information on the internet. Like, I mean, I, in the beginning, like in some of yeah, I, that was a transitioning market that I knew what developers would pay. And you had yeah. entrenched homeowners that were like, you know, house rich, cash poor, been there 20, 30 years, a little out of touch. I tell them 700. They think it was when I knew it was 900. But over the years, that seven to me became nine to me. And then that nine became one, one, you know, I mean, it just, but I rode the wave, but it's just, yeah, there's no, 
there's no houses burning down and insurance checks right behind it. That's <laughs> so I guess Tina's question was about absorbing their mortgage. I don't know if you got you do any of that stuff. Um, no, I don't know. That's I don't get it's, into that. It's nah. that's sort of like a Midwest kind of. Yeah. Like, they talk about it on courses. I don't know. And you're not going to get many banks to do that. Like, I don't know. Most people aren't even like the fine, like, unless they're doing seller financing, but keep it clean, keep it simple, like get creative and like helping them get out, but don't get creative and in inheriting their uh, financial mess. All right. I'm going to pop up a few questions here. Um, so this is from Chris. Uh, do you find a certain time of year your letters get better responses? Um, I always try to like gear up for like the spring market and the fall market. And then I'll do work, you know, I'll work on, you know, units through the summer, get them ready for you know fall rental. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's my cycle, spring and fall markets, but I get calls randomly, you know, it's, there's, there's no rhyme or reason with this spectrum of the business. It's not like you, it's not like a retail market, you know, that is typically, you know, centered around the spring and fall markets. Um, here we go. This is from my boy, Benny. Uh, how often are you adding to your mailing lists and who are you adding to the list? Um, that list gets repopulated every time we download it from public records. It's done by age of, you know, years of the property's owned. So that list is just going to always get repopulated. Always updates. Um, so yeah, that's I mean, just certain. So yeah, I mean, you, you, I mailed the same list. You twenty thousand people. Sure, you're gonna. Everyone's gonna be a different sage in their cycle. Um, and if you got four deals from that, you're, you're that's a home run. I don't. I don't know what this question really means. What about step zero, acquiring cash loans? Oh, so I have no money. I want to get involved. You have to find a hard money lender to work with you. Yeah, but even then, you're gonna knight me twenty percent down. I mean. I don't know. So I think what you do is this is the thing. Like it's it, you, it's awesome to acquire the deal yourself. If that's not an option, you call someone like me, right? Or you call Christian. Like there's that you have to understand that there's other options. It's the deal is number one, and on those early stage deals, you might not be able to acquire it. Maybe you can just make a referral fee. Maybe you can actually put it under agreement with a PNS and then do a wholesale where you're selling the you know selling a thousand the percent. I, I, I encourage that. If you're starting with zero and no money, by all means, put it under contract. Even if you don't, like, even if you have the thousand dollars to bind it and then just call someone that's more adept. And I've had that happen. I had a, a, a property for sale one time in some wall and I had a girl come in and she was trying to flip it to someone and she didn't know what she was doing. And I just said, put me in touch with your investor. I'm sure I probably knew him anyways, which I did. And I just said, she didn't know me. I said, but I'll make sure I don't close until you get paid or this works out. And I let him know. And he was a good guy. And she got paid. There was no paperwork. No one did it. I mean, it's it's rare people do that. Some Everyone's looking to grind and chisel. But I don't do that. I mean, you don't do that because they're going to bring you more deals. Uh, yeah. I guess I think if, and if you, if someone, you know, if someone screws you over on, you know, it might happen, but it, that you'll never bring them a deal again. And the guys who are successful in this, they're not going around screwing all the wholesalers over because you're the one that's feeding the business. So, uh, you know, I, yeah, my work, yeah, yeah. Like, you, you, you got to build, you got to network, you got to build out your team. You got to take care of the people who take care of you. And if you have no money, just get it under contract. Even if you don't have the money to get it under contract, call someone like a Ricky, you know, myself, and you just say, or someone, you know, you know, who's doing deals at that level and just ask for help. And they'll figure it out. And that's, you brought the deal and that's it. You're going to, you're going to make money. And so, you know, that's money you can put towards mailing. That's money you can put towards another deposit. It's money you can. Yeah. And I think, you know, belt. yeah, I think one thing too, be careful. Don't try to make, don't, what, what happens to me sometimes, these people bring me these deals and it's, they're making it no longer a deal because of the upcharge they're trying to make on it. So it's, you under, you need to understand that you can't bring me something that's not really a deal upcharge on it for your assignment fee or your whatever. And then it's no longer a deal. And then what happens is if you do that, you call me on those a couple of times, you're going to no longer be, I'm never no longer going to answer your call. So making like five grand or 10 grand and then continuing wanting to work with you. And then there's going to be a deal where you're going to tie something up and you're going to be able to make 50. And that's the time. 
but it has to be the right one. It can't be on everyone. It has to be on one that's way under. Listen, there's no problem. Like even now with my mailings, like I just did my last meal and it was like 27, 25,000 pieces. I put in a bunch of towns that I typically don't work in. My whole thing now is like, I don't know those towns real good, but I know people in those towns where I'm like, hey, I'll feed you leads. If you put a deal together, just swipe me, cut me a check, 20 grand. Make the yeah. numbers work that you can cut me a check for 20 grand, you know? And that's my goal is to just really, I'm happy with it. And, yeah. you know, it's, 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 you can't do every deal. You can't do every deal. And sometimes you can't do deals alone. And sometimes it may be a home run of a deal, but you'll go on to trying to do it yourself. So there's, there's no sense in it. And that's why partners are important and um, teaming up with people and, and um, you know, you have greater bandwidth and uh, you can get more done. Uh, what do you think will happen to the market now that Coronas has come through and what should we, what should we do as investors? So my thought on this is I think single family market's going to take a little bit of a hit because that's a more conservative buyer. It's, you know, husband and wife, maybe someone lost their job. They can't make a joint decision. Someone doesn't have enough balls, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of different items. It's tougher when you're in a couple and you, you're much more conservative and you may be having a baby or this and that. Um, so I think, you know, there's a pause on that. Maybe that market softens, but I think conversely, multifamily strong apartments get stronger because now roommate situations make more sense. It's lows the cost of living and, you know, investors are always going to be buying, looking for deals. They're much more of a, you know, uh, you know, they're not as conservative with their money. They're always you know going to be buying stuff. So I think co-living, and multifamily rules the day moving forward, even more so now. Uh, single families, you know, they might take a pause. Um, and I think buying multifamilies, you know, even those sellers are going to, you know, the motivated ones are going to be more, more motivated than ever. You know, my price today is going to be very different than what my price might be in September, October, given, you know, the climate today. Yeah. Um, Good. Yeah. No, this has been awesome. I think, you know, one last point I was just thinking about is, you know, after COVID, guys, make sure, you know, building, networking and getting out there and meeting with people, talking to investors, you know, I think building a social a brand on social media, showing that you're out there is, you know, a way to make sure that you're meeting people. So when that call does come in, you have the person to call if you're trying to wholesale, um, you know, don't do it when the deal gets to your plate, then start trying to call people, try to build a network ahead of time so that when you get that deal phone call, you know who to call about it. So, um, you know, once COVID's yeah. done, you know, make sure you meet people. A thousand percent. I think you're sort of, and, and don't try to hit home runs, like singles and doubles, consecutive singles and doubles win games. You know, yeah. you, you be, you'll swing forever and strike out. You keep trying to hit home runs. There's nothing wrong with just, you know, steady singles and doubles. And always you got to grow the network. Don't be afraid to ask for help because not a lot of people don't, not everyone has the deal. Not everyone has the money. Not everyone has, you know, the, the strategy to how to capitalize it, you know, be it construction or whatever. So you got to, uh, the more pies you split up, the more different pies you can eat. There you go. All right, Christian. Well, this has been awesome.